Run, run! The soldiers fired volleys of shots above their heads, but the asphalt road was barred and they were forced to make their way eastwards across the stubbly new, newly harvested fields. By now it was midday and the heat was intense. The sky so blue and hard it seems to glimmer like lazurite. In the coastal plain the temperatures in July can easily reach 40 degrees. There was no shade at all, only a few prickly thorn bushes growing among the rocks. Beyond the plain stretched a long hill and they could see a miserable, miserable procession of their fellow townspeople already stumbling towards the stony horizon. The Al-Ali family joined the procession, walking across the fields, stepping out briskly at first, buoyed up by their anger, and confident that this was just a temporary situation, that soon the Arab armies would drive out the intruders and they would be able to return to their home. After a few hours, as they mounted what they thought was the crest of a hill, only to find another steeper one stretching out ahead of them, their hearts sank. Sitting with their backs to the sun, the women pulled their scarves over their heads for shade. They ate some of the bread and olives and quenched their thirst on oranges. They had brought so little water. Who would think of carrying water instead of silver and gold? All around them, other families were sitting, too exhausted and dehydrated to move, while others abandoned the possessions they could no longer carry and plodded on up the hill in the searing sun. As the day waned, they came into the small village of Kirbata. There was a well there, but no bucket. The women took off their scarves, tied them together and lowered them down till they tipped the black circle of water, then pulled them up and sucked the water out of the damp cloth. The third day of the march was the worst. The women's sandals were falling apart, their feet were bleeding and swollen, nettish thorns and blue field thistles snaggled at their skirts and legs. Go, said his mother to her eldest son, Tariq. Go on ahead and find us some water to drink. Maybe there's a village up there with a well. But there was no water. All along the way, people were, people were fainting from thirst and exhaustion. On a rocky scree, the boy came across a woman staggering under the weight of a huge bundle. Two watermelons, it looked like. And he thought, if she drops them, I'll pick them up and take them back to my mother. But as he drew closer, the woman sank to the ground and he saw that she was carrying two babies. Help me, brother, she pleaded. My boys are too heavy for me. I cannot carry them. The boy hesitated. He was only 14 years old and he already had his mothers and sister, sisters to look after. But it was clear this woman was not going to make it. Take just one of them, she said in a voice that was barely more than a whisper. Tariq looked at the two babies. They looked terribly red and wrinkled, their eyes screwed shut against the light. How could he choose? Then one of them stirred and opened its eyes, which seemed to stare straight into his. The woman, seeing him waver, wrapped the baby in her shawl and thrust it into his arms. Go on, don't wait for me. Go, I'll meet you in Ramallah. That was you. The baby in the bundle, he nodded. A door opened, and, and sorry, this is sort of change of scene here. A door opened, and from the interior of the house, I heard the sweet jangle of Arabic music and the noisy patter of daytime television. Then Mrs. Shapira appeared on the doorstep, wearing her dressing gown and her Lion King slippers. Will you take a coffee, Midos? Mr. Ali didn't reply. His eyes were fixed somewhere else. My name is Mustafa he said quietly. It means one who is chosen. My brother Tariq told me this story. Did he tell you what happened to the other baby? I asked. Mr. Ali shook his head. He told me only that the soldier who shot the bridegroom had on his arm a tattoo, a number. After we'd finished our coffee, I left to go home. The sun was still shining and the cat was sitting patiently under the tree, gazing up at the thrush's nest. If only I had Miss Shapiro's gift for living in the present, I thought, as I walked past the front gardens, greening with new growth, trees, shrubs, weeds, grass, everything was coming to life. Near the corner of my street, a willow tree was sticking out its silvery buds through a railing. I thoughtlessly slapped off a pussy paws twig and my mind flashed back to the bunches of pussy willows and catkins we used to bring to decorate our class and Julia's school in Kipax. 
Soon it would be Easter. I remembered Mrs. Robottom's plonkety plonk on the piano and our thin wobbly voice as we, as, voices as we sang, There is a green hill far away. How that hymn had scared me as a child. It had seemed a harsh intrusion into the world of Easter bunnies and foil wrapped eggs. I knew now, as I hadn't known at the time, that those hills were not green at all. They were rocky and barren. I'd been puzzled by that then, by the absence of a city wall. Now I realised that so many walls had been built and knocked down and rebuilt again over the centuries, that time itself had lost track of what belonged to whom. He hung and suffered there. Yes, the history of that place was steeped in cruelty. Mrs. Robottom had glossed over the details of what had happened during the crucifixion and tried to convince us that without a city wall meant outside. But when I asked Dad, he said, war and religion, they both have an unquenchable thirst for human blood. They feed off each other like nuggins. Mum rolled her eyes to the ceiling. He's off again. What's Dennis? She's only nine. I never did find out what a nuggin was. Mum waited until closing time on Easter Sunday to buy chocolate eggs for us, when those that were left were reduced to half price. What do you want them fancy eggs for, Jean? Dad said. We're remembering an execution, not celebrating a birthday. But he ate them anyway. He had a real fondness for chocolate. I'm going to stop and pass you over to Roger.